Hey everybody, welcome back to the Canopy Roads channel. We are so excited that you are here. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to handle life's unfairness coming up. I think of a, an experience that I had my senior year in high school. I was a good student in high school. In fact, when I got to my senior year, I had not made a single grade less than an A in, in terms of the, the semester grade. Then came senior English and Ms. Branscombe. So the first assignment was a one-page essay. Wrote it, turned it in, got it back. There was one red mark on it, the letter F. I had never made an F my entire educational career. I'd never made an F. So I, I got that. There were no marks on it, nothing I had done wrong, no comments, just F. So I was shocked by that. You know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was wrong with it. Next paper, it improved to a D. Once again, no marks, nothing to indicate what I could do better. So I, I, my mom taught at the same school in the elementary area, and uh, she was really good at writing. And so I asked her, I, I read it to her, and uh, I said, you know, what can I do to improve? And she was, you know, she was shocked as well. It wasn't until after I graduated that I found out what was going on. So one day... In the teacher's lounge, Ms. Branscombe came in, and she announced to another couple teachers there, this year I have Matt Hall in my English class, and I'm going to take him down a couple of notches. And one of mom's best friends was in there. She said, why would you want to do that? Well, then she told my mom. But my mom never told me until after I graduated. And I'm so grateful that she didn't because she let me fight my battle with that unfairness. She knew a few bad grades wouldn't hurt me. In fact, it would prepare me for real life when school was probably the last time I'd ever make an A. But she helped me by not interfering. And then she told me, that she had had my teacher when she was in high school, and she didn't do well in her class. And she assumed that it was probably retribution now that she had her son who was doing well in school. Unfairness. Have you ever suffered an injustice? Ever suffered unfairness? Betrayal by a friend or a spouse? An unfair evaluation at work, maybe? An unmerited termination, even? Maybe racial or social prejudice? Maybe you were attacked because of what you believed? Maybe you were attacked because of something you said or a position you held politically? Maybe you were unjustly criticized about something that was taken out of context? We could go on and on listing potential unfairness. But life is unfair. I love the story of Joseph that we've been looking at for the last two weeks. It is a story of epic injustice, of epic unfairness. And we can learn so much from the way Joseph handled his grave injustice. And there's a principle I want to unpack today from, from this story as we deal directly with the injustice, the, the unfairness in his life. And it's this. When life's unfair, God's still there. Would you say that with me? When life's unfair, God's still there. In the Bible, we read real stories about real people. It's not fictional accounts. It's, this is, this is nonfiction. These are real people who really lived in history. And, and what the Bible does for us that we can't know from any other source it's what God is thinking and what God is doing, because it reveals that 
before, during, and after these events. Wouldn't that be great to know? Wouldn't you like to know what God is up to in your life right now? Maybe, maybe you don't believe in God, or maybe you're not sure that God exists, or maybe you think there is a God, but he, you can't really know Him. The Bible tells us what God is actually doing in our world while things are happening in our lives. And as we look at how He's dealt with people in the past, we can gain some incredible insights into what He is doing or what He might be doing or saying or thinking in our lives. Both times that Joseph experienced unfairness, the Bible says, quote, the Lord was with Joseph. So we can know that when life was unfair for Joseph, God was still there. That is a timeless principle for you and me as well. When our lives are unfair, God's still there. Let's pray, and then we'll dig into how to deal with unfairness. Lord, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for always being there, even when we can't perceive you. We know that your love is strong. We know that because of what you've done for us through the Lord Jesus on the cross. Lord, thank you for being there. Open our eyes to see how you want us to deal with the unfairness in our lives. And I know that there's some people today who are listening to this message who are struggling with epic unfairness. And I pray, Lord, that you would help them to see that you know what's going on and you are actually at work in the midst of that to work together for good. Lord, I just pray that as we go through this story of Joseph today, that there'd be practical, real-life lessons for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So how should we deal, how can we deal with unfairness? Number one, I think the first principle that we see in the life of Joseph here that's important uh, is to understand that we should accept that no one is exempt from unfairness. No one is exempt from unfairness. Many Christians believe, particularly new believers, that, you know, when I become a follower of Jesus, I repent of my sins and I start trying to obey what God wants, that life's going to get better, that I'm going to have less bad things happen to me. I'm going to you know, God's going to take care of the unfairness. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said this, John 16, 33, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. That means unfairness, persecution, hardship, difficulty, pain, embarrassment, all of those things wrapped up into tribulation. But take heart, he says. What did he say? I've overcome the world. That's how we can take heart. It's because we can know that he is in charge. Even in the midst of the unfairness, God hasn't forgotten us. He's not abandoned us. He's there. But we can, we can expect to have unfairness because it's a part of life in a broken world. Good people have problems just like everybody else. Becoming a follower of Jesus doesn't make you exempt. Deciding to be a vegetarian or a vegan doesn't make you exempt. Deciding to help at the homeless shelter doesn't make you exempt. Deciding to, uh, to, to get in shape and eat right doesn't exempt you from physical problems. It just doesn't. One of the most important keys, I think, to Joseph's success in dealing with unfairness was he never really saw himself as a perpetual victim. Do you? do you? Do you see yourself, I'm just a victim of circumstances. And you kind of always walk through life waiting for that next hammer to drop on you. There's just this cloud that just follows you around. The truth is everybody in the world is facing difficulty. Everybody is, some more than others. I know I look at some people and I think, what else can happen to them? Maybe that's you. But I also see people that I see that happening to, and they're some of the happiest people I know. Because they don't see themselves as perpetual victims. They see themselves living life in a world that's messed up, and just unfairness and difficulty and tribulation just happens. 
You see, Joseph trusted that God was still there when life was unfair, because life is unfair. Nobody said it would be. And Jesus clearly told his disciples, look, in this world, you're going to experience unfairness. It's just that way. People are going to persecute you because you love them and you love me and you want them to know me. People are going to persecute you for that. That's unfair. Yeah, life's unfair. So the sooner we understand that life's unfair, the better off we're going to be in dealing with that unfairness. Number two, trust God to support you through your suffering. Joseph did that. He trusted that God would support him through his suffering. Joseph's brothers, we, we looked at this the first week. J Justin handled this so well. J Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery and faked his death. But Genesis 39.2 says that the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. The Lord was with Joseph. Last week, we looked at how he resisted the, uh, the, the sexual advances of his master's wife. A and Joseph said no and no and no and no, and he refused to be with her or to be seduced by her. And then when that didn't work for her, she accused him of rape, and he was falsely thrown in prison. Genesis 39, 20 to 22, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. You see, there it is again. When life was unfair, God was still there and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Despite this second horrible injustice in his life, a young man with so much promise once again, he's experiencing something that he didn't deserve. When life was unfair, though, God was still there. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Joseph didn't surrender his faith, his faith in the face of of injustice. He didn't play the victim and said, woe is me, life is terrible, it just stinks. He didn't go around complaining about how terrible it was and how his brothers hated him, even though he was just trying to be a good brother. Yeah, maybe I was a little arrogant, but I didn't deserve this. And I was trying to, I, I was an honorable slave in my master's house, and I, I re rejected the, uh, the attempt of his wife to seduce me, and here I am, accused of rape and thrown in prison. I may be here the rest of my life, but he didn't, he didn't whine about that. Here's something to understand about trusting God. Faith cannot be stolen. Your faith in God cannot be stolen. Nobody can steal it from you, but you can surrender it. If you don't have faith, it's because you gave it up. So when life is unfair, there's a temptation to surrender our faith. But don't blame anybody else for it because nobody can take it from you. you can't, no one can take your faith from you. It can only be surrendered. But that's a good thing. Nobody in no circumstance can steal it from you. So when life is unfair, that's when you need faith the most. That's when you need to trust God the most. When you can't make sense out of life, that's when you need to draw closer to God. Let your faith be strong. My oldest daughter, Allison, was an exceptional student. I know this is hard to believe. She never made less than an A from kindergarten through college. She graduated from Auburn with a 4.0. I don't know anybody else that graduated with a 4.0. There's a few, but I, I didn't know anybody else. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm not praising her to, for that purpose, but, but to kind of point out what happens next. She has three wonderful children, our first three grandchildren, James, Elsie, and Abby. All three of them have learning disabilities. School came so easy for Allison. 
and it comes so hard for them. And she says, as a mom, it is so hard. James has ADD, and he's always been a strong-willed child. So when he gets into that ADD, and he's just kind of out of control, and he's 12 now. So you know what happens in middle school and puberty and so forth, and you add a little testosterone in the mix. It's just crazy trying to get him to focus on school. Elsie is the sweetest thing. You'll never meet a sweeter child, and she has severe dyslexia. She couldn't learn how to read. And, and finally, Allison got her with a tutor, and in, in, in less than a month, she was starting to read. A tutor that understood how she was seeing, how her mind was seeing things that, that seeing them double. And honestly, it was so bad, she would frequently walk into the door frame. And, and recently, she told Allison, I don't see two door frames now. Abby has some dyslexia, too. It's not as, as severe as, as her sister's. And Allison has wondered and said out loud a, a number of times, she says, why didn't God give me at least one that doesn't have some sort of learning disability? And then this week, I was talking to her about that, and I called her and asked her for permission to talk about her story. And she says, you know something, Dad? I think I'm finally understanding that receiving kids with disabilities is not an unfair thing, but God is trying to teach me something myself. So God is at work there, and she's trusting him. It's hard. It's hard. She, she's homeschooling all three kids. It's a challenge. But God is right there in the midst of it. Number three, persevere through your problems with the hope of God's promise. Persevere through your problems with the hope of God's promise. We see this so vividly in the life of Joseph. So, sometime after Joseph had been put in charge of the prison, Pharaoh threw his baker and uh, his, his cupbearer into prison. Now, we know what bakers do, right? They bake stuff that we love to eat. What's a cupbearer do? Well, a cupbearer was responsible for bringing wine to the king. And people would try to poison the monarchs. So he had to taste it before he gave it to the king to make sure that it was palatable and it wasn't poisonous. So he had a pretty valuable position. And one night, or one day, the king got mad at both of them and threw them both in prison. And sometime after they'd been in prison and Joseph got to know them, they each had a dream. And they, they came to Joseph and said, one day he, he saw that they were troubled, so he said, what's wrong with you? They said to him, verse, uh, verse 8 of chapter 40, we have had dreams and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. See, he's living sin. He's using this opportunity to have a conversation about God as he helps them. So Joseph enabled him to interpret the dreams. And he told the dreams to each of the guys, and uh, very specific. And the dreams had to do with future events. It was a prophetic kind of thing about what was going to happen to them. And he said to the, to the, uh, to the uh, cupbearer, well, three days from now, the king is going to call you back to your position, and you're going to once again be elevated to the chief cupbearer, and you'll be serving wine into the hand of Pharaoh himself. The baker was excited about that with a good, good interpretation. He said, well, what about me? He said, well, in three days, the king will call you out, and he'll chop off your head. <laughs> well, it happened just exactly as, Pharaoh, as Joseph had said. And before the cupbearer left the prison... He said, please remember me when you go to Pharaoh. Tell him about me and the dreams and the interpretation of the dreams. Uh, and, and please tell him um, about my, my state that I'm in here um, unjustly so that I can be delivered from prison. He promptly forgot. Until two years later when the Pharaoh had a dream that was troubling and he couldn't interpret it himself, so he brought in all of his counselors and none of them 
could interpret, they were all baffled. And the cupbearer remembered Joseph, and he told the king, is, I remember when I was in prison with the, uh, the baker. Remember you threw us in prison? Yeah. Well, this Hebrew in there interpreted dreams that we had, and they came true exactly like we had dreamed and exactly like he had said. So he says, bring him here, bring him here. So they called Joseph from the prison. And then he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And once again, it was a dream about future events. He told Pharaoh that your dream would be that, uh, means that there will be seven years of, of, of bountiful harvest, followed by seven years of horrible famine. And what I would suggest you do is you save a fifth of the crop every year during the years of plenty so that you have plenty during the time of famine. Pharaoh accepted his interpretation and elevated him to number two in the kingdom, right up under Pharaoh. Joseph never would have been put in this position had he not been sold as a slave so he would end up in Egypt. And he would have never met Pharaoh had he not been thrown unjustly into prison so he could meet the baker and the cupbearer, and he would have never been elevated had he not, if he'd have been all sorry for himself and all whining about what was going on or mad about it and always complaining about it and being bitter, but he cared for these other prisoners and he got acquainted with them well enough that they told him a very personal thing in their lives, their dream, and he interpreted that. He never would have been elevated without those two horrible injustices that happened in his life. You see, he persevered through his problems because he trusted in God's promise. Well, what promise are we talking about? Well, when, Jesus, when Joseph, he is kind of a type of Christ, when, when, when Joseph was a young man, he had dreams about his family bowing down to him. And that's one reason his brothers hated him so much. He's the little kid who, who's the favorite of his dad. And he's telling this story, and it was prophetic. And also, he trusted in the promise that his family, his people, would eventually bless the whole world. That's what God had told his great-grandfather Abraham, his grandfather Isaac, and his father Jacob. So when life was unfair... He persevered because of the promises. Genesis 41 tells us that uh, he, uh, he, he was elevated to this position, number two in the kingdom, and Pharaoh gave him a wife, and his wife had two kids. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second was called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now, let me tell you what this does not mean. This does not mean when he says, God's made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. It doesn't mean he forgot what happened to him. Do you, you forget your pain? No. He didn't forget his family. What this means is that he had released his bitterness about his hardship. He'd released his bitterness toward his family, and forgiven his brothers. And, and the second one means that he had, it, it reveals that his gratitude was to God. He says, the name of the second to call Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. He was just basically saying out loud, when life was unfair, God was still there. Remembering God's promises helps us persevere through our suffering. A couple of verses in Hebrews have been such an encouragement to me when I've gone through challenging times and felt discouraged and, you know, just kind of whined about my, my circumstances. These verses have been so helpful to me. Would you read them with me together? Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. 
He doesn't say, don't let anyone steal your faith because no one can steal your faith. What does he say? So do not what? Throw it away. Don't throw away your confidence in God. Don't throw away your faith in Him. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, that's when you'll receive what He's promised. Do you need to persevere through your problems? Maybe you're a mom, and you're struggling with something that just feels so overwhelming. Maybe you think it feels unfair. A lot of unfair things happen with moms. and You, you just stand in there, and you persevere. And maybe that's what you need to hear this morning. You're struggling. Maybe it's a wife or a husband, and you're struggling with unfairness in your relationship. In conflict, and maybe you feel like just giving up. Maybe your students who are, are struggling in school, and you just school is hard for you, and you can relate to my grandkids. That there's something that you struggle with, and it just feels like it's impossibly difficult. Some of you are dealing with chronic illness or a chronic injury, and sometimes you just feel like quitting. Or you just feel like becoming bitter the rest of your life. Maybe some of your business owners and you're so tired of the rat race and trying to find employees and trying to, to get clients and trying to meet deadlines. And it just feels overwhelming. It's just this, this load that you carry with you every single day. And nobody knows that unless you are the CEO or the owner of a business. You just, nobody knows what the leader at the top carries. It's lonely at the top. And maybe you're just feeling a little overwhelmed, and you're just tired of the stress. And maybe someone here without faith just feels like they're going through life, and life is about karma. Life is about just luck. It's not. There's a God who's out there. And he has made some incredible promises by sending his son to die for us. He loves you. And whatever you're dealing with right now, don't give up. Persevere and know that God is with you in your suffering because of what he's promised. And then finally, number four. Trust God to leverage your pain for good purpose. Trust God to leverage your pain for good purpose. So during the famine, it happened. The seven years of plenty were amazing, just like he told Pharaoh, but they saved up for it or during it. And then came the seven years of famine. And by the way, we hear about those things still happening in that part of the world from time to time. Uh, I mean, over the last couple decades, We've seen famines in Ethiopia and Chad and Somalia and that, and that part of the world. And, and I suspect there's going to be an enormous food shortage this year in some of those poorer countries because of what's happening in Ukraine. Ukraine and Russia together account for 29% of the, of the world's corn exports. An enormous amount of uh, barley and wheat as well. So during the famine, Joseph's brothers came to buy grain the first year. He recognized them immediately, but they didn't recognize him because it had been 24 years since they sold him. And for all they knew, they didn't know he'd be in Egypt. For all they knew, he was dead or some hopeless slave somewhere. Joseph toyed with them. He kind of tested their integrity harangued them a bit, gave them food for their family, and eventually, the second time they came back, he revealed himself to them as their brother. Finally, after these 24 years of unfairness, unfairness that started it, unfairness right in the middle of it, after these 24 years, he finally understood what God was doing 
in the midst of that. And he said this to his brothers, Genesis 25. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to, to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you, keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. What a different perspective. This unfairness in my life is not accidental. God is, is actually in the midst of it. He says, what you meant for evil, God turned around and used it for good. God never wastes our pain. He never wastes the unfairness in our lives. He never wastes the tribulation that Jesus predicted. The Apostle Paul captured that well in, in this verse. Let's read this verse together, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, he works together for good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God's good purpose may not always be evident to us. Sometimes it's, it's veiled. In July of 2011, Terry, my wife, uh, headed out to Lexington, Kentucky to help her aunt, to, who was a hoarder, to help her get rid of some stuff, straighten up her house, paint some rooms. She, she was going to spend a week or two up there. And just north of Atlanta, a lady got in the wrong lane of her four lane and hit her at 65 miles an hour head on. And many of you know that story. It was it was traumatic. It was a miracle that, that Terry survived. Broke both her legs, a bunch of ribs, and a lot of bruises, um, but did not break her neck, did not break her back, did not have internal injuries, and today you would never know it. I never felt like asking, God, why? And Terry said she never did. In fact, Terry said something powerful Somewhere along the recovery, she said, I, I never ask why me. I ask, well, why not me? I'm not any more special than anybody else. And that perspective helped her immensely. And, and we saw that God was with her during the recovery. Uh, the, the rehab center that she was sent to after spending a, a week in Great Memorial in Atlanta, was five minutes, literally five minutes from Allison and Jim's house with our three grandchildren. So I stayed there and commuted for those three weeks she was in recovery. And then the irony of this is that today, Terry is caring for her aunt here in Tallahassee. In August, in, in summer of 2019, she had been talking to Joyce for... For years, Joyce is an unmarried aunt, no children, um, and Terry's mom passed away many, many years ago um, when she was 51, died of leukemia. And Terry had always felt like, as the oldest in the family, you know, I need to take care of Aunt Joyce. So she had been asking her for years to, why don't you just come on, move down here so you'd be close to Matt and me and we can take care of you. And, you know, Kathy and Dave, uh, another of Terry's uh, sisters, uh, they, they live in Orlando, and Kevin, you know, her brother lives in Macon, so, you know, it, it, so come, come on down. Finally, in, uh, in the summer of 2019, she talked her into coming down and, and living with us. And we didn't know at the time until Terry went up there and spent some serious time with her uh, to prepare her to come that dementia had already begun to set in. And so we brought her down here, and many of you have met her. She's been here on Sunday morning, so... Um, and, and I can talk about it today because she's not here, but I, the story is poignant, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, so we've been caring for her here, and we, and we cared for her in the house for about five months, and that just was not working out. She was not happy there, so we put her in an assisted living facility so she could have some independence, and, and her dementia got worse, and then she had COVID in, 
in February this year, and her dementia just plummeted. I mean, her mental capacity just plummeted, and uh, she was unsafe there. So we, we just recently, on, on Monday, moved her into a memory care facility, and um, six people in, in our small group were so sweet to help us move her. It was, it was kind of a complicated setup. Terry and, and, and another friend had to take her for lunch and shopping while we went to her current apartment in the assisted living and took all of her stuff and put what we needed to put in the new place, which was much smaller, and store the rest of it. So we had to get over there and quickly do our thing six hours later. Um, so uh, they, they worked with us, and they were so sweet. And, and after it was over, and I was just sitting at home exhausted, and Terry was exhausted too, um, I just, I, I told Terry, I said, you know, what I'm, what I'm seeing in all of this, and knowing the whole story from really from Terry's accident in 2011 to go help Joyce, I realized that this is what love looks like. It's when you, when you do wonderful things for someone that really can't love you back. She can't remember three or four hours later that Terry's seen her, that Terry's, like yesterday, gave her some gifts uh, for Mother's Day, even because she knew all the other, a lot of the, the moms there would be getting gifts, and she didn't want her to feel like she was left out. But she won't remember that. And I see many of you doing the same kind of loving act. And honestly, this is what mothers get before dads, because so much of what you do proves to be thankless, doesn't it? You don't get the thanks back. That's real love. Jesus dying for us on the cross was ridiculously unfair, right? Ridiculously unfair. Who would do that? Would give their life for people who didn't ask for it, didn't admit that they had problems or needed it? Most people just want God to fix their lives and make life happy and take away the unfairness and the difficulty. And Jesus got involved in the midst of it gave his life for us. So you see, in the midst of what some would say is unfairness, having to care for someone with dementia, and some of you are doing that, I get to see what real love looks like. And I, I wouldn't necessarily understand it without living through it. So God is using what some might say is an unfair situation. Why would you do that? Not your mom, not your dad. God said, do it because he's at work. You see, God is always at work trying to accomplish something good, even in the midst of our unfairness. When life's unfair, God is still there. So just understand that no one is exempt from unfairness. And, and the sooner we get that through our minds, the sooner we're going to be able to cope with the unfairness. Trust that God will support you in your suffering. Persevere in your problems, just looking toward God's promise. If you're a follower of Jesus, the promises are future and they're amazing. So it's, it's, it's worth what we're going through now in order to experience eternity with Him. And trust that God will not waste your pain. He'll leverage your pain for His purpose. Let's pray. In a group this size, I'm sure that there's someone who's dealing with something that feels unfair or feels overwhelming, and I would love to pray for you this morning. So with the heads bowed, if you're feeling that, would you just raise your hand so that I can pray for you? Okay? See those? Others? Just feeling okay? Yep. See those? Others? Feel like that's just overwhelming. Yep, I got you. Anybody else? Yes, I see in the back back there. Lord, I just pray for these folks in this room and those who are watching online. They just feel overwhelmed. They feel like life is unfair. And it just is. You promised that, Jesus. You said that we would experience unfairness but it sure hurts when it happens. It can feel overwhelming. 
Lord, I pray for these folks who raise their hands. I pray that you'd help them to know that no matter how hard it is, what they're going through, and overwhelming, and unfair, and disconcerting, and confusing. Help them to know that you are right there with them. Help them to know, Lord, that if they feel like they're blaming themselves, even if they do have a part in this, help them know that your grace is sufficient, your forgiveness is so strong. And some of them may feel like, I didn't do anything. Help them to know that your grace and your love and your mercy is adequate for what they're feeling. Lord, open their eyes to see that you are there with them to support them. Help them persevere through their problems. Help them know that you're going to leverage their pain for a good purpose. Help them know that there's more on the other side, that you will navigate them through this. Lord, I pray for that person today who is not a person of faith, who's struggling with similar things without you, God. I pray that you'd help them to know that you want to be in their lives. You won't barge your way in. They have to invite you. I pray that you'd help them to take that step, Lord, to trust you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Well, we hope this content was valuable to you. If you found it valuable, go ahead and hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed to our channel already, I'd like to invite you to do that. When you subscribe to the CRBC channel, you stay up to date on all the content that we put out on a weekly basis. And we would be honored if you would share this content with a friend via social media as well. You know, here at Canopy Roads Baptist Church, we are on mission. That mission is to develop fully devoted followers of Christ. If you'd like to partner with us in that mission, I want to give you two quick and easy ways that you can do that. Number one, go directly to the link on the screen. Or number two, scroll down in the description and click on the link that's there. Again, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you back here next week.